Like I told you, we have uh, uh, two sets of guests with us today, and we wanted to sit just for a few minutes with uh, two best-selling authors. They don't really need much of an introduction because they were with us last semester. Their book went uh, high up in the New York Times bestseller uh, list, and this one as well has already done very well. But it's called Trump's Enemies uh, with David and Corey. Man, thanks for being here. Can we welcome David Bossy and Corey Lewandowski with us Thank you. today? Honor to have you. Tell us about the premise of this particular book, and uh, yeah, what can we expect? Well, first, let me say uh, it's such an honor to be back at Liberty. As you know, uh, I flew in this morning from Israel. I want to thank you and the school for all the work that you do to support Israel and the tough fight that they have over there. So thank you for that. Um, but look, this book is, is something very special. And what it is and what should scare people and what students are going to learn are there are two separate sets of rules. Those sets of rules that pertain to Hillary Clinton and the crooked left and those that pertain to everybody else. And if you don't believe me, look at the news this morning. Roger Stone, who I know very well, I fired him. I know the guy very well, okay? He was, he was the best, one of the best firing decisions I made, but I fired the guy, okay? He's a bad guy. But the FBI this morning at 5 a.m. broke down his door and dragged him out of his house in his bathrobe because of some potential things that he did wrong. That's not what happens to the left. And what this book is about is the way they treated General Mike Flynn and how they treated the rest of the Clinton cabal, the people who got immunity, the people who spied on Americans because they didn't like our politics, and the response from the president of what he saw after he became the president. And what we do is we take you behind the scenes to tell you what the president knew, what Barack Obama knew, and what they allowed to happen to Americans because they didn't like our politics. That's what this book is all about. Well, th first I just want to say thank you all for having us here today. It means a lot. We were here last year and, uh, you know, your hospitality, Pastor, and, and, and Jerry's hospitality, you guys are amazing. And what you mean uh, to students across America, I don't know that you understand. I get asked about Liberty University all across the country. Uh, it's an amazing thing. So um, it, it, it means a lot to me to be here. Uh, this book is, is, you know, very important for us. Uh, as Corey was saying, it's, it's really about our relationship with the president and our, you know, we're, we're just two average guys that got... He's average. I'm not average. <laughs> He's very average. I mean, not so much. Uh, <laughs> um, and and that's, that's exactly how we operate. It, it is, it's a lot of fun to be with the president during the campaign when he was candidate Trump. Uh, and we've been with him since the very beginning. And so for us, it really is about watching what Corey was talking about, how he and his team, our team, get treated differently than Hillary's folks. If you look at, at Corey's example, whether it's Mike Flynn or Roger Stone or anybody in the news, and you, you look at how the Trump team is treated versus Hillary Clinton's team of Cheryl Mills and Huma Abedin and Heather Samuelson, who got interviewed by the same FBI agents, but were granted immunity in those interviews as opposed to Mike Flynn. And so that's what we try to describe to the readers is a lot about our time with the president, whether it's on Air Force One, in the Oval Office, uh, in the Beast, and some of the some of this book came from those conversations, and we we were very lucky in that President Trump granted us uh, a one-hour interview in the Oval Office that is published in this book. It's the only book in his first two years that has an interview with him in it. And so we're, we're very blessed to be able to have that type of relationship, and w we just want the American people to be educated so they understand what the narrative of the left is. And that's, that's why the president calls it the fake news. That's why the president says the enemy, one of the biggest enemies of the American people are the fake news divisions out there, whether it's television, newspapers, and, and to see exactly what he's up against every day. He gets up every day and he tries to do the best he can for the American people every single day. And this book really just talks at length about those fights that he's in. So, but outside of just um, the 
the undermining of the presidency uh, and, um, and just the skewed views of the media. Uh, this book is a bit of an all access pass, right? It's a bit of a backstage pass into what it's like to travel in Air Force One and other, th tell us more about what outside of just 101 politics and that, what else can, can someone expect? Well, look, book? It, it, it's so special and I never take it for granted, but Dave and I right before Christmas had the opportunity to go to the White House and have lunch with the president. And um, what'd you eat? Uh, we had a Wendy's? Bread steak. It was like a piece of charcoal, I think, but it was, you know, the White House steak, so it was good. Okay, but it was. It's how the president likes it, so we all eat it the same way. With a lot of ketchup, I think. A lot of ketchup. Uh, but, you know, we go there and um, we raise an issue with the president, whatever it is, and he immediately picks up the phone to solve a problem because he's a problem solver. And what we talk about in this book is. Our ability, Which is kind of scary for the, us, just to be honest yeah, right, with you. This, he picks up the phone to solve whatever we want to talk about immediately, which, which is a little scary. But, but look, you know, there's, there's one point that Dave and I are in the Beast, which is the presidential limousine. And we're sitting with the president, we're driving in the car, and we're coming back from a rally, and we're pulling up to Air Force One, and we have this giant motorcade behind us, and we're talking about Bob Woodward's book. And we talk about the people in the White House who didn't support the president, didn't vote for the president, but found their way to weasel their way into the administration to implement their own agenda. And Bob Woodward talked about those people who were taking documents off the president's desk. And as we're having that conversation, we say to the president, hey, we're writing a book. He says, well, fellas, come on in, I'll talk to you about it. And so as we sit there in the beast, then we get on Air Force One, we start talking to the president. Then he says, hey, how you fellas getting back to DC? Well, uh, he says, do you have a car? I said, no, I don't have a car here, sir. I don't know. No one has a car in Washington. He says, you need a ride? I said, yes, I do. And that put us on Marine One, the helicopter, which flew us through the city and landed us on the south lawn of the White House. Uh, a pretty amazing experience for a kid who grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, to have the privilege of being there next to the leader of the free world and him. And we ask him, and we ask him all the time. How's the family doing? You know, you guys have Melania Trump here. How amazing is Melania Trump, right? What that family has been through and what they continue to fight every day and what Dave and I try and do in this book and then on television with our friends like Pete, who you'll hear from in a minute, is to try and tell people the truth of what's really going on. Because as we, Dave and I sat there in the presidential dining room on the news, it said, White House in chaos. And I said, chaos? I mean, the steak's not that good, but I wouldn't call it chaos. I mean, so, you know, it's kind of amazing that we sit there and we live this every day. And what the president has to go through and the stories of BuzzFeed last week where if he did this, it would be worth impeachment. If. When did the news decide if something happened, that's when it was going. So this book is about what it's like to be next to the president, what it's like to be on Air Force One, what it's like to travel with him, what it's like to be in the car, and listening to what he has to fight every day so we can go out and keep fighting for the American people. Can you define for me, just because uh, a lot of our students hear the word deep state, and different people are trying to just get to define that, how the deep state is undermining the, define deep state for us. That, that's a that's a great question because a lot of people, you know, they say deep state and they think it's a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy. What we mean by the deep state is the permanent bureaucracy in Washington. Those that are there for generations. Some people work in the federal government for thirty or forty years on both sides on, of the aisle. On both sides right. of the aisle, but predominantly they are on the left. And what they do is they undermine presidents, uh, no matter who it is. So you you they have what we call a we own you rent mentality. You're here for four years, we're here, or maybe eight if you're lucky, but we're here for 30 or 40 years. We're going to ignore your policies. We're going to do things to slow walk your policies. And that's the insidious nature on one side. And then the deep state is also the James Comeys, the, 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 the McCabe's, the Strzok's, the FBI agents, and I hope a lot of you know their names now over, the, over this past year. But it is those folks that have, that have these, James Baker, who probably folks don't know that well, but he was the top lawyer at the FBI who is under investigation right now for G giving the fake dossier to the high-ranking folks in the FBI in order to get those FISA warrants, and it's into the weeds here, but those folks who are the permanent class, McCabe, who was number two and became acting FBI director, 
His wife ran for office in Northern Virginia as a Democrat and got three quarters of a million dollars from Hillary Clinton's best friend, Terry McAuliffe. And so it's that really um, behind the scenes nature that folks don't, don't understand and know about. We cover that in the book. And, that's, and then it's the deep state is also the permanent media class too. So we define it throughout the book and I think folks will find it very interesting and educational. So just last question, if, um, if you're not as politically savvy or inclined, you know, as some of the other people in the room, uh, what, what, what's another reason outside of politics to read this book? Like, just if you're, if you're a patriot or if you're interested in knowing how things operate? No, no, I have four kids, I have to go to college, so that's one of the reasons, okay? We have to, but, but in addition, look, this book is about what it's like to see behind the curtain, to see what the president is really talking about and really what his concerns are. This book is the president's own words. It's the only book in two years that he gave that interview for. So if you want to know what he thinks about his predecessor, Barack Obama, or you want to know what he thinks about the FBI or the way he's treated, we ask him a very simple question. It was one of the first questions we asked him. Knowing what you know today, do you regret running for president? Because this is a man who had a phenomenal life and his family was going to do very well. And before I could even finish the question, he said, Absolutely not. It's the greatest thing I've ever done. And whatever I did before that was baby talk. The, the, what he's doing now to fix the country, to put our country back in a path where we can be proud to be Americans again, is so important to him. And not just for this generation, but future generations. And that's what this book is about, is listening to the president in his own words and understanding what it's like to be on the inside from two guys who have the privilege of being with the president this week on Tuesday, to spending time with the vice president, to traveling on Air Force One, to being in the beast, to being on all those places that you see. And um, if you like America at all and you love this country, this is the right spot to be. Man. And, I, and I'm just going to finish by, we, we, we talk about a lot of the negativity in the book, but we also talk about the president's accomplishments over the last two years and the, the great things that he has done for America and all Americans. Doesn't, he doesn't care who you are or where you come from. He does everything every day for every American. And that goes for the economy, that goes for strengthening our national security. So it, at the end of the book, we do a very positive review of what those accomplishments are and what the future looks like in the next two years. So thank you very much. So you guys have time to go up there and be happy to sign to book. Absolutely. Wow. Can we thank these gentlemen for being here? And again, the book is $5 today only. Everywhere else is about 30 bucks. So that's a great gift uh, as well. Hey, we want to show a video for our next guest uh, as, a, as a means of introduction. But um, I know you already recognize Pete from Fox and, uh, and Friends uh, on the weekend morning. It's the number one show in, in their uh, demographic. He's also um, just a great patriot who served in the Army forces. Uh, he, he went to his university time. He went to Princeton and Harvard. Obviously couldn't get into Liberty, so settled for that. But uh, let's watch this video and then uh, we'll introduce Pete. Pete Hagsack, our own Army veteran and Fox and Friends weekend co-host. He went to take part in one of the drills. We got to observe what they do at NORAD and in this Air Defense Command. Sense into the tactics that you use, how you train for an active shooter. I just got back from a four-day tour of Israel. And while I was there, I was able to look at the, the, the umbrella of terror that the, that the Israeli people face and how the IDF is taking it. Road. A stone's throw away from the Gaza Strip, protected by an Iron Dome battery. What is the most important step in creating an efficient system for veterans to apply for benefits? The Secretary Shinseki should step down. Honorable man, he's been there for four and a half years. Really? Hasn't gotten how much does America mean to Israel? And how much has the last year meant after President Trump? Decision. President Trump's proclamation is a historic decision. A lot of your supporters, to be honest, Mr. President, are hoping that you will stand firm on that $5 billion mark or well, something. we are. We have no choice. We have to have border security. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. It's the first time I'd seen that. I forgot about half of those things. You know, I'll tell you this, I feel a little, this is weird, I've never been to Liberty, I've never been on campus before, but I feel a little bit at home standing on this stage. I gotta say. I'm from a small town in Minnesota, Forest Lake, Minnesota. We got some Minnesotans in here? Excellent. Small town in Minnesota, 
I went to a small church called First Baptist Church in White Bear Lake, and there were about 100 people when we first went there. Today, it is known as Eagle Brook Church, and about 30,000 people worship on a Sunday in Minnesota. So they have performance like this with music, uh, and to see a room filled with so many people who believe in something bigger than themselves from this generation is something to see. So God bless you guys in Liberty University and everything you do here. As was mentioned, I used to wear camouflage makeup. Uh, I was a platoon leader in Iraq. I led with the 101st Airborne uh, for a, a combat tour. And I, I guarded bad guys at Guantanamo Bay for a year and was in Afghanistan for a year as well. And I traded all of that in, so now I wear makeup and sit on a couch. But I have the great fortune, I'm on the weekend of Fox and Friends, so if you're ever up before 10 a.m. on Saturday or Sunday, which I don't know if it's true for this crowd, tune into Fox News Channel. I took, when Tucker Carlson went to primetime, I took his spot on the weekends. So just to be clear, I am not a journalist. I have never called myself one. I'm on the show to give my opinion to provide context and experience to the news of the day. And as Corey and David pointed out, there's just a little bit of news to talk about these days. Just a little bit. But for me, it's not about being on TV. It's not about working at Fox with a, a tons of great people, which is an amazing honor. I don't know where our country would be without Fox News Channel. Uh, it wouldn't be where it is today. And we wouldn't have Donald Trump likely in the White House. It's an honor to work there. But for me, it's an extension of service. It's an extension of purpose. It's an ability to keep fighting for that flag in the back of this auditorium and the greatest country the world has ever seen that we can never take for granted. Because there's three things I always talk about that remind audiences, and I, I don't get a chance to talk to young people as much as I would like. I'm usually talking to, uh, you know, rubber, rubber chicken dinner fundraisers of people that write checks and Republican Party things and things like that. So I always love it in those audiences when a young person comes running up to me and they say, Pete, Pete, I got to take a picture with you. Will you take a picture with me? And I say, sure. I, I, wow, you, you watch your young person watching Fox and Friends. Great. And they go, yeah, my mom really loves you. <laughs> Great. Or my grandma really loves you. So we're trying to bring the demo up for the young people on the show, so maybe we'll get a few more viewers after this. But what I remind every audience we I talk to is, first and foremost, you have to know this, history is not over. You do not live at a special moment. The Greeks thought they were inevitable, the Romans thought they were inevitable, the Brits thought they were inevitable. Everyone who has been big and powerful and prosperous has eventually gone to the wayside, or gone to the dustbin of history. This is the 21st century. This is the greatest country the world has ever known. This is the richest country, the most powerful country, with, I would argue, the best president in modern history. He would say better than uh, Lincoln, maybe, too, right? Depends on what day you catch him on. But, there's, but history does not hit pause. You are about to enter a workforce. You're about to start a family. You're about to go into, you know, your sophomore year or junior year. You can't assume that you're going to walk into a prosperous environment unless you do something about it, unless you are engaged. History is not over. And that leads me to the second point I always talk about, which is America is not inevitable. There's nothing uh, inherently perpetuating about our country. Nothing says America will always be the greatest. Nothing says America will always be the best. Ronald Reagan said it, I think, most, most succinctly. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. You don't pass it to the next generation in the bloodstream. Every generation has to fight for it and understand it. That's why this institution and others like it, like Hillsdale and College of the Ozarks and other schools that put values first are going to be what brings our country, but keeps our country great and passes it to the next generation, to my kids, to the kids are, that are just a twinkle in your eye, to my grandkids, it is not inevitable that America will be a free country 
or a country where you have an opportunity with those God-given rights to be whatever you want and achieve whatever you would like. Because there are a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas around the world. Which leads me to the third point. If history's not over and America is not inevitable, then if the 21st century, the century we all live in right now, if the 21st century is not an American-led century, meaning we're, we're the big boys on the block, then the 21st century, the century you live in right now, will not be a free century. Freedom will literally be in retreat. There's nowhere else to sail to. If, if the crown gets too powerful and is impeding on our rights and our debt is so big uh, and our welfare state is so large and our deep state so powerful that we can't change it, there's nowhere else to go. Europe is a museum, literally a museum. They open their borders, they demand no allegiance or assimilation inside those borders, they gut their militaries to pay for their welfare states, and then they hope you'll come visit and take a Viking river cruise. They're out of history, they're done. The most popular boy's name of a newborn boy born in London today three times over is Muhammad. London will never look the same, the UK will never look the same. They've decided to give up on believing in what matters the most. They've given up on Western civilization, just like, just at the moment when other people believe their view of the world is ascendant. We saw it on 9-11 with the attacks of 9-11 and radical Islam. There is a belief in that view of the world manifest in ISIS and elsewhere. I looked them eye to eye, did night raids and kicked down their doors. They believe the future is theirs. They believe you are evil. They believe Muhammad professed it and that it will someday be so. Just as our society, oftentimes in Western civilization, is rejecting God, rejecting truth, rejecting uh, free market capitalism and thinking that socialism is what's going to bring us all the things that have made us great, we're starting to reject, just as they're starting to believe more and more in their inevitability. Same goes with the communist Chinese. You know, the communist Chinese have a dream. It's that in 2050, they will be not just regionally dominant, but globally dominant. They believe the structure that America set up after World War II, which was meant to perpetuate peace and meant to give us the biggest seat at the table, just kicked them to the corner. And that the Chinese civilization is meant to be the civilization to rule in the future. 100%, A number one, that is what they believe. And every moment that we are weaker is a moment that they grab more land more influence, more economic share, more oil share, more influence in South America, in the Middle East. That is the vision of China. You probably don't even, probably not even thinking about that. They are. They're kids that they're pumping through state-run schools and state-run universities and state-run think tanks and into their massive military. They're thinking about it. So who's it gonna be if it's not America? Radical Islamists, the Chinese, Russia, International institutions run by guys in skinny jeans and pointy shoes in Brussels. <laughs> Drinking lattes. You think they care about you? No, they think, if Hillary Clinton thinks you're deplorable, imagine what they think about you. No, they think America is the source of all evil. European bureaucrats. There's nobody else. America is the human experiment it is the only hope in human freedom on the planet. Either we restore her or we lose the fight for freedom. The road to serfdom is the road that we are headed in. Look at Venezuela. Look at countries that decide to go in that direction. That is why I believe what Donald Trump did in 2016 was a seminal moment for this country. And I'll tell you this, I was not a, um, Trump supporter to begin with. I was a conventional conservative all the way, sick of Barack Obama's attempt to fundamentally transform America. And I said, you know, I want the conservative litigation of Obama. So I was like, I'm for Rubio, he's my guy. And I ran a vets group and he was really good on vets issues and so I, and then when he lost, I was in for Cruz. And then when Cruz lost, and I know he announced here, didn't he? His presidential campaign, he's a great senator. Then, I was, then, I was, then it was clear that it was, that it was Trump, but I didn't really understand it. I didn't understand the moment of what it represented. And then I had, like a lot of people, you had that Trump conversion moment. 
Like, you don't want to tell anybody. But then you realize, oh man, this guy's onto something. This is a break glass in case of war moment. This is a moment where we're not fighting our daddy's Democrats anymore. JFK, John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States, a Democrat in 1960, would be a conservative Republican today. The left has gone so far left that they are now litigating, they're fighting against the principles our country was founded on. And Donald Trump said, this is not a think tank exercise anymore. This is a knife fight. Either we win or they win. And once you start to internalize that, that it requires that fight, it, the, the whole election takes on a whole new lens. I'll tell you this, I met, um, these guys have spent a lot more time with the president than I have. I didn't meet the president until after he was elected. And I was under consideration to potentially be the secretary of the VA, of Veterans Affairs. I've done a lot of work on trying to reform the VA. We're proud of that work. We got, the president has done amazing things, bringing accountability so guys can, people can actually be fired at the VA now. Uh, veterans might have choice to actually go to a private hospital instead of get stuck in failing bureaucratic hospitals. Very proud of all the work he's done there. But the first time I met the president was interviewing with him for that job. And I think it was, it was Reince Priebus met me at the base of uh, Trump Tower. I went up to, I think it's the 27th floor, 26th floor. I don't even know what floor it was. And I walk up and I, you know, I've seen him on TV. I've interviewed him a couple times, but never met him. Around the corner and I walk into his office and there's, there's the president-elect. And I said, Mr. President, uh, it's, it's so nice to meet you. And the first thing he says is, at the beginning, you were very bad to me. <laughs> very bad. <laughs> First words the president-elect says. It's true. And he goes, he cuts me off, he goes, uh, at the beginning, who are you for? Who are you for? And I, and, I, <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, I was for Rubio because He's, he, was, he was great on vets. He goes, oh, little Marco, huh? <laughs> little Marco. And then, and then he turns to Reince and he goes, w weren't those nicknames great? Little Marco, Lion Ted, Crooked Hillary. And, and, then I, and then I cut him off for a second. I didn't really cut him off. I just tried to interrupt. And I said, Mr. President, I have to say, my favorite one is Pocahontas. And he goes, a lot of people tell me that. I mean, a lot of people. And then he went into a two-minute sort of mini rant about Elizabeth Warren and about how she's, he's, she goes, she's a total fraud, fraud. And he, <laughs> I'm working on my impression. And you know what? That's why his critique is so devastating because it's grounded in a true argument about the fact that if you're gonna get a professorship at Harvard, you shouldn't get it because you're faking your ethnic background. You should get it because you earned it. And, and then you shouldn't turn around and use that professorship as the platform to run for president. And so rather than do what politicians normally do, which is say, well, Elizabeth Warren should have submitted her stuff properly and we should launch a, committee to look to launch an investigation to possibly reprimand. He's like, I'm going to call her Pocahontas because he's a marketer and he knows how to bring. And then everyone starts to realize over time she misrepresents who she is. She has no shot in the presidential election because he nicknamed her and gave her one she deserved. And I will say this, those are the couple of, these guys are better at listing the accomplishments of this president than I am. And they're, they're legion. I mean, moving the embassy, scrapping the Iran deal, Paris Climate Accord, cutting taxes, regulations, judges, Cav I mean, th the Supreme Court, all of those things will change our country for years, for which I and many are grateful. Rebuilding the military, crushing ISIS. But to me, it is the culture war that he is willing to wage against the left that has turned, tur not only turned its back on America, but is pointing its finger into the chest of Americans and saying, you're the problem. America is evil. America is based uh, on, on, on the sins of the past. And while all of us acknowledge that America isn't perfect, we prefer, we prefer to dwell on, on what she has done for the world as opposed to sins of the past, which many of us would acknowledge. So it's the cultural critiques. And, and of the three, that I think he's taught Republicans and conservatives. The first is his war on political correctness. 
Political correctness is almost the deepest poison to a body politic, to a public discourse. When you control the speech, when you control what people are allowed to say, you control everything. So when the president stands, I call him the see something, say something president. Because he looks at it, and he sees it, and he goes, that doesn't look right. I mean, that is jacked up. And most politicians would be like, well, um, we're going to have to consider a series of options. To, and then he's just like, tweet. <laughs> tweet. And then everyone's talking about it. And then everyone else, like you and I, has the courage to stand up and make that same argument. It's almost like he provides a shield. I call it a Trump spine. A lot of us have grown one because he's taught people that it's okay to say in a free country what you believe, and it doesn't make you racist, it doesn't make you sexist, it doesn't make you an Islamophobe, it doesn't make you any of those things. It makes you a patriot who loves this country. The second thing that this president has done of the three that I'll mention is his exposure, as Corey and David talked about, of the fake news media. For too long, thank you, one person agreed with me. For too long, the minds of America was captured by, you know, three or four news readers who stood there for 30 minutes at, in the nightly news and read a teleprompter, which is not hard, by the way. You could teach a robot to read a teleprompter. But they decided what you heard, how they spun it, and what the truth was. And there was no other option. Then came things like Fox News, then came things like Rush Limbaugh, and now podcasts, and all the other ways in which other opinions are a part of the conversation. And guess who hates it more than anybody else? All the executives in New York City. Because they're all liberals. All of them. They all went to Princeton. They all went to Harvard, they all went to Columbia, and they all certainly think they're better than you, and they think they're better than me, and they think they're better than every single person that voted for Donald Trump. They do. It's in their DNA. So when they put their shows together, and then they hire hosts that think the same way, and staffers that think the same way, and that's why you get the product you get on networks other than the Fox News Channel, because they all think one way, and that's why they hate Trump. He didn't play their game. He doesn't play their games. And when they try to perpetuate the fake news, what does he do? Tweet. And they hate it. And they hate it. But that is an opera. He is the news. He can critique the news. Then he comments on the news. Then they have to comment on his comments. Then pretty soon they have to rewrite the news. And then he points out what's wrong in the news. And then he makes more news. It's a situation they've never been in before, and he's exposed them for their bias. We all have biases. It's impossible. That's why I stand on the, on the couch and I say, I am a conservative. I have always voted Republican. This is who I am. If you don't like it, too bad. If you like it, you know where I'm coming from. If you don't like it, let's have a conversation. That's what this is about. You couldn't do this at Princeton or Harvard. You couldn't do this. I wouldn't be allowed to speak. That is not America. And that is not the values we stood on a bridge in Lexington and Concord 240 years ago to fight for. I refuse to live under speech codes and behind political correctness. And the final thing I'll mention is Donald Trump has taught us how to fight. This is not the time for academic arguments. This is not the time to just hope that something goes our way. This is the time to fight back and punch back. He's a famous counter puncher. I think a lot of us have not physically punched back. That's not what I'm talking about. Of course, that's, you know, anyway. Be unapologetic. Be unafraid. And just like my small little Baptist church in Minnesota, listen, I'm no saint. I'm a sinner like you. I've, got my, I've made my mistakes, I've had my successes, and I've had my failures. But because I was given the foundation of faith and of patriotism, love of country, working hard, individual responsibility, believing in something greater than yourself, that my rights are given to me by God, not by a government, I can handle what comes next. 
The foundation you're getting here at Liberty will prepare you for the rest of your life. Just, just do me one favor, never back down like our president. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Bless you, brother. Hey, before we leave, um, I, I do, I do want to say uh, two quick things to you. Uh, number one, uh, I probably got 10 texts from different people wanting to know, uh, can, we, can, can we have people from the other side of the political world? Obviously, we do. I, I want you to know that we invite, uh, I personally have invited, uh, you know, when Michelle Obama's book came out, we invited her to come here and talk about the book and have a book signing. Uh, I've invited President Obama on multiple times. We invited the vice president uh, multiple times. Uh, we invited John Lewis to come at MLK, who grew, you know, as a close friend to him. And, and, uh, and on occasion, they do come our way. And on occasion, sometimes uh, they feel like this place isn't maybe friendly for them, but they, they, they misunderstand that we are a graceful people and always want to learn. And so just will you, will you, will you clap if you agree with me? We, we want to formally invite people from all walks to come. Please, please. Um, Michelle, come to Liberty, right? Like, come on. Um, we'd love to hear from you. We invite, we invite, um, we invite reporters and, and columnists and people from all walks to come all the time, and, and uh, we'd love to see them. People, always, uh, people also asked me this morning, um, hey, where, where's President Falwell? This would be right in alignment. Uh, would you pray, listen to me, will you pray uh, for uh, just our, our president and the Falwell family? He, he was up till about 5.30, 5 o'clock this morning, just physically. I, I think he caught a really, really bad cold, and so uh, he, he wasn't able to be here this morning. And there's so much, so much that goes into being um, the, the president of this university, so much pressure always on him and his family. So many people that just come up on them unfairly all the time. And so can, let's do this. Can we pray for our country together? And can we pray for our president and for Becky and, and their family as well? And, and then we'll dismiss and uh, get out of here. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are and um, who you continue to be. God, our greatest allegiance is to you. We, we are your children, and we know that, God, the only thing that really can solve all the issues of this nation is an awakening, a revival. So, Jesus, you really are the answer to every single question, ultimately. And we pray for this nation. God, unite this nation. Bring us together, God, on things that uh, break your heart. We pray, God, specifically for the Falwell family. I pray just healing for uh, President Falwell. God, uh, I know he's just... Uh, battling this bad cold. And so just help him, Lord, be with him in this moment. There's so many of us uh, just battling that. And so we just pray for him. We pray for their family. God, just the hedge of protection around them. Uh, pray for Becky, God, as our leader as well. We love you. We're thankful that we have them in our lives and as great advocates and leaders. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Hey, remember, there's a book signing. You can get the book for $5. Come on up and say hi. Thanks again. Bless you.